Hello, and welcome to the first candid conversation of the 2012 election season. This civic media program is produced at the WCKN student-run cable television studio on the ground floor of the Student Center of Clarkson University. This series of voter education programs is a partnership production of Clarkson's Communications and Media Department, St. Lawrence County Chapter of the American Association of University Women, and the St. Lawrence County League of Women Voters. My name is Bill Wimmer. I'm a student at Clarkson University and managing editor of the Clarkson Integrator. I and a number of my classmates provide the production crew for this series. Our first program is a conversation with Amy Tresitor, Democratic candidate for the 48th Senate District of New York. Speaking with her today are local AAUW member Ann Carville and Liam Hunt from LWV. All of you, welcome to Clarkson. Now, Ann, I turn the show over to you to get us started. Okay, well actually I think Liam's going to get us started if you don't mind. Yeah, my first question really is why do you want to be a senator? Uh, but let me break it down a little bit. <laughs> uh, what would your main priorities be if you were elected to the 48th District Senate? And what are your qualifications for achieving those priorities? Well, right now I am a county legislator in the county of Oswego. I um, am running because I feel that we need a, a citizen legislator, a true citizen legislator, and by that I mean someone who wants to be a legislator to speak for the people. Now that is a common um, phrase that is used by legislators and candidates, and I understand that. But I am a legislator now. I know some of the needs of, of counties, what we face with our budgets. I'm a, a, I have a, a background, I think, that lends me to um, understand a lot of what people are going through today. I grew up on a dairy farm in St. Lawrence County. I, uh, we, my husband and I moved to Oswego County in 1979. We're both graduates of SUNY Canton. And he went to uh, Oswego for his job at, at Alcan at the time. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we've uh, raised our five children in Oswego. They're all grown now. And I'm a person <coughs> that believes in, in giving back to my community, and I think that it's, that it's time for me to do that. Priorities. What right. would they be? Priorities are um, campaign finance reform is big with me. Uh, maintaining home rule, which is the authority for local governments to govern themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I feel strongly that without home rule, we become basically administrative arms of the state. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that local communities, counties, cities, towns and villages want that autonomy, and I think they should mm -hmm. have that. Mm -hmm. Good. We'll come back to campaign reform. A okay. little bit later on, and some of these other things will come up as we go. Um, Anne, over to you on education. Okay. Um, it has been said that our faltering education system may be the most important long-term th threat to America's economy. In the North Country region, as you well know, because you're from here, our rural schools are heavily dependent on state aid. We're not wealthy up here. Funding for schools has been significantly cut over the last few years, and the result has been the loss of many teacher jobs and uh, programs for students. It is impacting the quality of the education we can provide for our students up here. What changes can you propose to help our schools get the funding that they really desperately need? I, I'm really concerned about this because I graduated from one of these rural schools, Herman DeKalb. Mm -hmm. And the state aid formula is a very complicated formula. I think that it needs to be uh, looked at and, and maybe revamped so mm -hmm. that it's more understandable for everyone. I've looked at it and it's, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think it's difficult for everyone to understand. And I think basically what needs to be done is that we need to sit down with all the stakeholders in education. We need to sit down with teachers, administrators, parents, and students and, and talk about how we are going to best meet the needs of, of the students in, in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. Because our students deserve the same education as every other student in New York State. We can't let the North Country schools deteriorate. Some people have talked about a regional district, and I don't know if that's the right answer or not. Um, I know that there's, there's a lot of pride in, in community, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't want to see that go away. And I know that there is a lot of fear of losing your identity in a bigger environment. Mm -hmm. and, and those are valid. Those are valid fears. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that we have the minds and we have the capability of working through this 
and we certainly need someone who will be a, a, a voice for the North Country that understands these problems and truly cares. Great. Um, I'll follow that up with, with another question, if you don't mind. I have a list in front of me. You can see the font is very small. Okay. It's mm -hmm. four typed pages of unfunded mandates that are put on the schools. We won't inflict these on our viewing audience. No, no, no. I can see them. Trust me, it's a long list. It's really a crushing list of, of requirements. Many of them are very costly. Uh, educational leaders in this region uh, feel that they need a reprieve from this because it keeps building and building and building as state aid is being pulled away uh, significantly. Will you make uh, dealing with unfunded mandates a uh, priority? That's a huge priority for me being a county legislator because we have similar lists. We have sent several resolutions just this year to the state dealing with different unfunded mandates and asking for relief again and again. We deal with them separately mm -hmm. and we deal with with sending a resolution saying please deal with this problem as you said you would that that has I think been made a little more pressing because of the tax cap mm -hmm. and as I've said before a tax cap is a good idea no one wants their taxes to go sky high mm -hmm. but when you do that when you limit a jurisdiction's ability to create revenue mm -hmm. you have to then create a, an atmosphere where you get some relief from the mandates also. Right. And it's not that, that some of these aren't good ideas, mm -hmm. but we have to at the state level make sure that when we're legislating that we're not duplicating legislation mm -hmm. that already exists, mm -hmm. that we, we look very carefully at what we're requiring of, of our local schools and to see if that actually fits the community. Mm -hmm. What fits the whole state may not be a good fit for, for rural s schools in the North Country. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's got to be really uh, looked at. So this list needs to be gone through, you know, and the people who do the work, the teachers, the people at the schools, they tend to know what's really important. Right. And it's like that at any level, whether it's a school, a county, uh, any business you go to the source and you'll get a lot of your answers and that's why I said before we really need to sit down with everyone and actually listen not just create a study not just just talk but really get do some brainstorming to come up with what are some of the solutions mm -hmm. and, and that they have to be cost effective and they have to fit our communities right. and I'll just follow up on it because you made a good point about the tax cap uh, curtailing the ability of schools to generate revenue at the same time that there have been highly significant, significant cuts in aid. Why do you think there has been so much inertia about alleviating the fiscal distress caused by these uh, mandates? Unfortunately, I think sometimes in politics, the legislation that gets the most attention is, is is, is taken care of first and that may not be the most important legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate, to, I hate to, to be cynical about that but I really feel that this is it's very um, time consuming and maybe not a little tedious for politicians and, and, and um, representatives and unless it is given priority I don't think that it's going to change anytime soon because it's not something that's going to make splashy headlines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, education is a very, very uh, sensitive issue, should I, should I say, because the education of our children is so important. This is where they spend a lot of their years growing up mm -hmm. that we can't take for granted anything that we do as far as, as our tax dollars when they go to to our education it it's just I, I just can't say enough about how important educating our children are and I I've been someone as a parent who has said that I would love to see more education and less preparation for testing mm -hmm. I think a lot That's of time I think a lot yeah. of time is spent yeah. on on performance mm -hmm. instead of learning mm -hmm. I'd like to move from education is okay onto the broader topic of economic development because obviously 
very closely related to education. You need education for economic development. You need economic growth in order to forge your education right. system. Um, what ideas do you have about how we can promote economic development in the North Country without destroying what makes the North Country a uniquely pleasant place to live, the issues of environment, quality of life? That's so. one of the things I've talked about a lot because mm -hmm. I said as much as job development and creation is important, mm -hmm. people in the North Country and where I live in Oswego live where they live because of, exactly. of the environment that we have. And the trick we, is to be able to keep more young people here and attract similar young people yes. to, to the region yes, by and building we do up have, our, we our quality. We do have yeah. a very unique uh, countryside mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and I grew up here and I love the North Country and I love Oswego it's a very beautiful place but in order to support schools and in order to attract business we have to have good schools mm -hmm. we also need to have jobs that fit now that's where the what challenge sort of comes in mm -hmm. well that's where the challenge comes in we have four universities just in St. Lawrence County mm -hmm. and what I would like to see is is a partnering between these universities between the assets we already have, we have agricultural assets, we have the port in Ogdensburg and in Oswego. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of what we already need to promote new jobs and business. We just have to uh, work with the colleges to see if we can create some uh, workforce development that fits this area. Maybe in, uh, technology is booming. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is a type of industry that can be brought into a community like this without destroying what we have here. I know that you uh, grew up on a dairy farm. I did. And obviously farming is a major industry. Equally obviously a lot of small dairy farms particularly are in economic trouble. On the other hand, there are new developments in, in agriculture, the locavore food movement. People are demanding uh, more humanely treated uh, natural foods that perhaps create considerable marketing opportunities here. What strategies would you suggest to strengthen small farms, small businesses generally? I think that we need to keep promoting local. Uh, I also don't want to leave out the bigger farms because mm -hmm. they do have a role in feeding the world. Mm -hmm. The thing about farming is that with a lot of businesses you have to worry about creating a market. What, Where is your mm -hmm. market going to be? There's a ready-made market for farming. We all eat. Mm -hmm. So there's a disconnect somewhere between the production of food and the delivery of food. I, I would like to see that um, we have, and when I talk about labeling, I'm, more, I'm talking about marketing. And so that mm -hmm. when people want to buy local, that it's easy for them to identify what's local at, at their grocery store. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that happen. The, I, uh, I ha there's a local grocery store where I live and they will display locally grown mm -hmm. uh, and produced food foods so mm -hmm. that that helps so mm -hmm. I, that's another thing I, I always look to using what we have the minds that we have here mm -hmm. and we do have so many ideas and we need to take advantage of that mm -hmm. and encourage our local farmers uh, encourage our farm markets but also understand that local cannot feed everyone right. and and that we need to also support our uh, larger farms mm -hmm. and um, make sure that we know that, that they're not suffering under too many regulations either that are always meant with good intentions and sometimes right. can be... Right. Economic development, of course, requires energy of one kind or another, yes. and that raises other environmental issues. There was a very interesting conference last week at St. Lawrence University on uh, climate change, specifically mm -hmm. global warming. And what came out of that conference, there were a number of distinguished scientists, was that there really is a very broad consensus that we have a problem, that it's largely man-made, and, and man rather than woman-made for the most part, <laughs> uh, and it needs to be addressed. And there are a lot of debates about how to do that. Uh, I wondered, uh, are you concerned with global warming? Do you think it's real? Do you think it's a problem? Do you have any um, suggestions as to how New York State, for example, might address those issues? Certainly, I think it's real. I, I, I think that we have to... Uh, look to science to answer a lot of our questions. What our solutions can be is a difficult question to answer because there's always that problem with energy production as to what it does with the environment. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk downstate about hydro hydraulic fracturing. That was my and next that's, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's very contentious. Mm -hmm. Do you I, support uh, Cuomo's apparent sort of moratorium? on this, or at least there's a delay process? Um. I, I do. I think that we have to be very careful. If we destroy our water supply, mm -hmm. 
that that's vital. That it's mm -hmm. vital to to all of us, whether we're in our yeah, homes. It's a complicated or, issue, but there are horror stories. There's no question. About there that. are mm -hmm. horror stories, mm -hmm. and I always like to look at at not only facts, because but facts are very important. But then you have to look at every side of the issue and, and the concerns that people are, are bringing to the table. Because we do need clean energy. We do need to, say, to safeguard our environment. Mm -hmm. we, so we, we have to listen to all the voices, uh, sift out what's real and what's, and what's not. And we always have to be concerned with how people uh, perceive things because that's, that's very important. We, uh, the citizens of New York State, pay the taxes that keep the state going, keep their local governments going. Mm -hmm. And so what they feel about any particular issue is always vitally important. Right. Another aspect of economic development, of course, since we are in a market society and that produces uh, some people who do better than others for various reasons, the whole question of economic justice. And I think Amy has some. Okay. Anne has some questions. I'll step in here. Um, traditionally, female job titles like librarian, nurse's aide, social worker, child care worker, etc., are paid less than other jobs that require equivalent education and responsibility levels. There are currently no laws in New York State that require fair pay for job titles such as these. In fact, the New York State Fair Pay Act has been stalled in the State Senate for some time now. If elected, how would you address this problem? I would definitely support the pay, Fair Pay Act. Mm -hmm. This is 2012. How long has this been going on? Mm -hmm. You know that we have been struggling with this issue, and it's it's time to address it. Um, I can't say enough of how I feel about about that about mm -hmm. equal pay for equal jobs. It just it, it's every job deserves the dignity of a of a salary that people can live on. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what we own our work, mm -hmm. our labor, whatever that is, whatever it is that we bring to our job, we own that. And we're not being paid for our time, we're being paid for the unique abilities and skills that we bring to our jobs. Mm -hmm. And that has to be honored. Well, good answer, I like that. Uh, another point that I'll make is that the current minimum wage adjusted for inflation is below what it was in the early 1970s. What's your position on raising the minimum wage? I am in favor of raising the minimum wage for many of the same reasons that I just said. I, I, we were told in Oswego County at one of our legislative meetings that you would have to work 85 weeks to afford rent on a two-bedroom apartment. 85 hours per week mm -hmm. on minimum wage. That, that's not doable. That, I, I've also heard the argument that no one lives on minimum wage. Mm -hmm. And I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. I would like to take uh, anyone who has that argument around and, and go to some places and introduce them to some people who, who do depend on that. Mm -hmm. Because they are there. I, I lived here. Mm -hmm. I know what people do for, for a living. And it's important that people are able to make enough money to feed their families, mm -hmm. to pay for their rent or their mortgage or whatever it is they're, they're paying to live, because that's what keeps our economy going. It's the people in the middle class that keep our economy moving. Mm -hmm. You need more than to just buy food, shelter, and medical care. You need a little something to to left over so you can go out and spend money. Mm -hmm. And that's what mm -hmm. keeps our economy going. Without that, we're not going to come out of a recession ever. Mm -hmm. It is a very common misconception, or it's a political argument, that, well, the only people on minimum wage are high school kids mm -hmm. <coughs> who are just doing it part time. It's in fact, as you know, quite untrue. Mm -hmm. The largest very single untrue. group are single mothers yes. mm -hmm. uh, who don't have a lot of margin for error. Yes. Um, let me come back on economic justice. This circles back in a way to the education issue. Um, there are different ways of taxing. There are different ways of you know, paying for education. Uh, and some are, as they say, more regressive or progressive than, than others. And I just wondered how you feel about the relative fairness and efficiency uh, of, um, let's say, property taxes as opposed to income taxes as opposed to sales taxes, because the sales tax is a controversial issue in St. Lawrence County. The sales tax is a very controversial issue. I feel that the sales tax is the most fair tax we have because mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, 
that's it, paid by a broader group of people, including people who come from outside your county or your mm -hmm. town or your village that may purchase <coughs> things. So I, I'm in favor of, of sales tax. Uh, property tax is a very difficult topic. Our property taxes in New York State are one, some of the highest in the country. And I can testify to that. <laughs> I think everybody can testify to that. How do we encourage people to, to purchase homes if their property tax is more uh, demanding of their salary than their mortgage? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult for them. What I fear it raises problems for education too, and linking property taxes to it certainly education. does. Because if you don't have that base, areas, yeah. if you don't have that base where you live, mm -hmm. you're not going to have that kind of money for your educational system. If you don't have mm -hmm. any any type of uh, wealth in your property, right. and if you if you just keep raising that assessment, mm -hmm. the pe you're going to outprice the people that live there. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to maintain the ability for people to buy property, homes, in their counties. We have to be able to finance our school districts. And it comes back again to our state, our state aid and how that's going to be determined as to where it goes. You know, the, the rural districts, should they be getting a bigger share of state aid because they don't have that wealth base to draw mm -hmm. from. And I think we definitely need to figure all that out. It's very, it's so important. We need to, in, in the North Country, attract quality teachers. We have teachers being educated right here in, in Potsdam. We, so if we, can, if we can figure all this out, maintain a, a quality education system, attract good teachers, and make our property affordable for these people. Teachers need to live in homes, too. Mm -hmm. And and so it, it, it all comes back. It's all a circle. And and that is why, and it even comes back to my opinion on, on home rule and how important that is, that, that local communities have some decision making in, in their in, in their local governments so that they can address these issues. Right. The question of home rule brings us around to the whole political system and most New Yorkers I think would agree that we have some problems with our political system in New York State. Uh, and I wondered, well first of all there's a long been a reputation for sort of partisan gridlock mm -hmm. uh, and my question for you is uh, how do you account for that and what could perhaps be done about it? And how much is that due to the role of money, the increasing importance of campaign contributions, special interest lobbies, and so forth, in manipulating or distorting the system? It's one of my favorite topics because I'm a, a person that's running a grassroots cam campaign. And when I say grassroots, I, I really mean grassroots. I'm raising all my money locally. Mm -hmm. And it puts you at a disadvantage for certain things like getting your message out if you don't have a lot of funds. That being said, I want to be that example for people that you can run for office. I grew up learning that in this country as a child when I was a little girl in school, anyone could be president. Now they're trying to tell people like me, you can't be a state senator unless you have X amount of dollars. And to get those dollars, you're going to have to go outside your district. You're going to have to attract money from corporations that may not have an interest in the North Country. They mm -hmm. may have an interest in how you vote once you get to Albany. And to me, that's one of the problems of big money in politics. Are, are we going to go to, to Albany or wherever else we're elected? Are we going to go there and are we going to speak for the people we represent? Where is our authority going to come from? The authority has to come from the people. If the authority that that you have, you feel comes from your political party or your the people that funded your campaign, you're not going to be able to speak for the people exclusively. And you have to be able to, to have an independent voice so that, that you're not afraid to lose the next election. You've got to be able to speak for the people in the way that you think is the right way. If that means you're not funded, then you should be okay with that. Mm -hmm. 
What can be done in terms of campaign reform, specifically in the wake of the Citizens United decision, which seems to open the floodgates for unlimited private contributions? One answer you've already given, you can run campaigns like yours, an mm -hmm. example, and hopefully win from your point of view. Um, but what room is there for public funding of elections? I mean, what, what kind of uh, campaign reform legislation might you be inclined to support, for example? I know that public funding for some people is, is a is a topic that they, they don't agree with because they don't feel that tax dollars should be funding mm. campaigns. However, if, if your tax dollars are funding campaigns, that directly affects you as a taxpayer. Mm -hmm. your, this, is, this is your representative. Who do you want choosing that person? Do you really want to be told as a citizen that a dollar bill is worth more than your vote? I don't think so. So I do think that we need some really good reform, in, at least in New York State, so that we have limits, so that we have more transparency. That is a very important part of campaign finance reform is the transparency so that you know where your um, candidate's money is coming from. We already have a certain level of that here, but I think we need uh, clearer ethics reform on, on campaign finances. It's a very vague uh, system we have in New York State as to how a rule is broken. It's not only that, that we have rules about campaign finance, but what are the penalties? What is the process to, to, to deal with campaign finance law that has been broken? Mm -hmm. That needs to be addressed. We need to know exactly what people are expected to do in a campaign. It's very difficult when you run for office to try and, and figure a lot of, of the rules out. Mm -hmm. So um, that needs to be addressed as well as the money issue. And mm -hmm. I think that we need a, a more uh, fair playing field so that everyone feels that they have the capability of running for office and so that the voters feel that their vote really matters. Okay, I guess I'll jump in here. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Terceter, you are in your second term as Oswego County Legislator right now. You're running for State Senate against Senator Patty Ritchie, the incumbent. We have a few minutes left, and we would like you to take those few minutes to tell voters out there something they don't know about you or some topics of importance that we didn't get to cover. Okay. Uh, as a legislator, I have been uh, very vocal about accountability within our within our government. I am the, that person that always asks questions about the resolutions that come forward. I like the language to be very clear and not vague so that people understand what we're voting on. I, I have um, requested that when vehicle requests are made that we have uh, maintenance records with them because I feel that we need to know why we're buying things and and whether other people feel that that's micromanaging or whether it's um, token, that this isn't a lot of money. These little purchases that, that the government sometimes feel as a small amount actually add up to being quite a, quite a bit. So I, I'm, I'm very adamant about knowing what I'm voting on, getting the answers for the taxpayer, because any time that, that I feel that there's uh, issues that need to be cleared up or language that needs to be explained further, I assume that the taxpayer would feel the same way. So I always feel that every time I'm voting on anything, whether it's a vehicle replacement or a mandate relief, I always try to look at it from the viewpoint of the taxpayer because that's who you're there for. It's mm -hmm. about other people. It is not about promoting your next campaign. It is not about agreeing with your political party even though, I mean, that is where gridlock comes in when it's just about politics and nothing else. And, and so I feel very strongly that it's the, the, the people's voice that, that needs to be uh, represented. Okay. Okay. Well, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. We appreciate it very much. Thanks. I'm sorry, but we're out of time. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to talk with us and for your willingness to participate in our local civic media program. Please come back next week for another candidate conversation. Until then, remember, our North Country matters.